Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel of the Whiteboard Doctors. Today we're going to be talking about class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs. For those of you who are just checking out this video and the channel for the first time, we've been doing a series on antiarrhythmic drugs. We started with an introductory video, then talked about class 1, class 2. Today we're going to talk about class 3, and then in a future video we're going to talk about class 4. There's going to be five total antiarrhythmic drug videos. We're going to link them in all the antiarrhythmic drug video descriptions. If you want to follow them kind of in order, that might make the most sense. If you're just interested in class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs, that's what we are going to be talking about today. So class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs are commonly referred to as potassium channel blockers. All right, so their primary mechanism, and many of them actually are, are have multi-factorial um, mechanisms, are blocking the potassium channel. Excuse us, what does that mean? So the potassium channel is responsible for uh, phase three repolarization, as well as kind of phase one and two as well. Um, so this should look familiar for those of you who've been following kind of the the uh, the series here of antiarrhythmic drugs. But we have phase zero, which is sodium coming in. Sodium is positively charged, which means that you know this initial negative, let's call it 90 millivolts, starts to become less negative and more positive. While this is happening, we get towards phase or yeah, phase one, where sodium or potassium, which is also positively charged, starts to flow out. That then brings the depolarization closer to, um, you know, less positive, more negative. At the same time, sodium channels are starting to close. Phase two comes along and calcium says, well, wait, let's kind of plateau for a little bit. Calcium starts flowing in. Eventually, calcium channels flow, close, and then we just have potassium flowing out, which then leads to the rest of repolarization. Okay, so class three antiarrhythmic drugs, potassium channel blockers, um, by blocking potassium channels, all right, we are going to, oop, I don't know that why that went crazy. We're going to increase the time that this cardiac depolarization cell is repolarizing. You're going to prolong that, you know, phase two. And by doing such, you're going to prolong the QT interval. What does this mean? Well, if we look at an EKG, an electrocardiogram, we get the um, tracing, right? You start with a P wave, which is atrial depolarization, and then you get into the, um, the QRS, right? So you get QRS, and then you get your T wave, which is repolarization. So here you have a P wave, here you have a T wave, and then you have kind of the QR. S. That's a widened QRS interval, but just ignore it for now. Pretend it's tighter. So what we get here is a prolongation of the QT interval um, because you get prolonged repolarization, right? That this area here ends up being longer. So you repolarize for longer, so you get prolongation of QT interval. The reason this is um, efficacious is because you can't depolarize while you are repolarizing. So by prolonging the QT and prolonging repolarization, you decrease the ability to depolarize again quickly. So potassium channel blockers are great for re-entry tachycardias. Um, what that means is that the abnormal um, um, action potential, the abnormal rhythm, is trying to depolarize the cells too quickly. So if you prolong repolarization, decrease the ability for that cell to depolarize again, this tachycardia can't re-enter quickly, and that's why it's great for re-entry tachycardias. All right, so that's the mechanism. Now let's talk about the different drugs. I set up a little table down here to do so um, because um, multi uh, many of them are kind of multifactorial. So the first one's amiodarone. This is probably the most common one, and its therapeutic uses, um, primarily we see this for ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation you can give it, and then atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter right? Because all these are tachycardias where there's lots of re-entry. The comments that we would say for amiodarone is that it has a very long half-life. So half-life T1 half is half-life. Actually from 25 to 60 days. So extremely long. 
It also has, believe it or not, class 1 antiarrhythmic, which is sodium channel blockade, class 2 antiarrhythmic, which is beta blockade, class 3, which we're talking about right now, which is potassium blockade, and then also class 4, which is calcium channel blockade. It has class 1, 2, 3, and 4 actions. So we talk about it as a class 3 potassium channel blocker, but it actually has actions for all of them. Because of this, it decreases the, it prolongs the, uh, decreases the velocity of the action potential, prolongs the refractory period, and is great for all those re-entry and tachy dysrhythmias, okay? There are some serious adverse effects that can happen, all right, AE adverse effects. Um, these most commonly and most tested are things like pulmonary fibrosis in the long run, all right? It can cause hypothyroidism, but can also cause things like liver dysfunction in the short term. So you got to monitor those types of things. All right, next one is dronenderone. Um, this is often used for AFib, A flutter, so just those atrial tachy dysrhythmias. It is structurally related to amiodarone, which I actually didn't know until I put together this discussion. So structurally, it's related to amiodarone. I'm just going to write related to amio. With that, though, it has a shorter half-life. So as we saw with amiodarone, the half-life was 25 to 60 days. The half-life of dronenderone is only 13 to 19 hours, which is still a fairly long half-life for a drug in general, but obviously much shorter than amiodarone. As related to amiodarone, it also has class 1, 2, 3, and 4 activity, right? So sodium channel, beta blocker, potassium channel, calcium channel, all right? And that's very similar to amiodarone as well. And then just so you know, it is contraindicated, CI, contraindicated and decompensated heart failure. So decomp heart failure, you don't want to start it. Um, studies have shown worse outcomes in decompensated heart failure. And then the FDA um, essentially said that there's a warning for acute liver failure. All right, so there's an FDA warning that it can cause acute liver failure failure, which will do ALF for acute liver failure. All right. The last thing to note is that it's actually only approved for paroxysmal AFib, um, not permanent AFib. Um, what they essentially say is that you want to start it in someone who is in sinus rhythm, but intermittently flips into AFib. You don't want to give it to someone in permanent AFib. All right, bretillium. Bretillium is primarily used for ventricular tachydysrhythmia, such as VTAC and VFib. It's only available intravenously. It does have this odd thing where you get norepinephrine release initially, followed by norepinephrine inhibition. Um, I do inhibition circle with a cross through it. So you get release of norepinephrine first, followed by inhibition. And this can actually lead to hypotension. So I personally have never used this medication, but you want to monitor for hypotension if you're going to give IV bretillium. All right. Sotolol. You might recommend uh, recognize Sotolol from our class 2 antiarrhythmic discussion as a non-selective. Um, it also has class 3 actions. It can be used for ventricular tachycardia as well as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. All right. And then just of note, as we talked about, it also has class 2, obviously, beta blocker activity. So that's kind of the big comment there. All right. Ibutilide. Ibutilide is primarily used for atrial tachy dysrhythmias, AFib, A flutter. It also is IV only. So you can't take it orally. Um, it can cause arrhythmias. So it's kind of a, you know, you got to be careful when you use it because it can treat atrial dysrhythmias, but it can cause arrhythmias. Um, you essentially get this slow inward um, sodium activation, which can delay repolarization. So it has potassium channel effects, but it also has this slow 
sodium inward activator that also, just like if you blocked potassium channels, slows repolarization or repull. All right. And then last but not least, dofetilide. Dofetilide is primarily used for atrial dysrhythmias, AFib, A flutter. It is a selective potassium blocker, so it doesn't have alternate class activity. Um, it has been associated with, though, and again, this is just like ibutilide, associated with life-threatening dysrhythmias. So you can use it to treat atrial dysrhythmias, but it also can cause life-threatening arrhythmias, which, you know, when you are inhibiting certain channels within the cardiac action potential, obviously that's something that can occur. All right, so these are class 3 antiarrhythmics, the potassium channel blockers. Um, that's how they work. Those are the different potential uh, medications and uses. Hope that this was helpful. Let us know what questions, thoughts, comments you have down below. Um, feel free to hit subscribe, follow along, check out our other antiarrhythmic videos and other uh, videos in general, and we'll see you all next time. Stay well.